Hi guys, it's your science teacher here, back with a, another video. This time, um, we are going to go through the whole of C14, which is the Earth's resources. So let's get started straight away. So the topic of Earth's resources starts off by looking at the difference between finite and renewable resources. Now, a finite resource is just simply something that will eventually run out. And some examples of finite resources are crude oil, coal, and copper. Renewable resources, on the other hand, are resources uh, that we uh, can regrow or can replenish themselves. And examples can include wood and sheep's wool. There are a lot of naturally occurring resources um, that we can find that are renewable. Examples um, include uh, things like wool, silk, um, and even down here I have a cotton plant. However, we do not always choose to get these resources um, naturally we come up with synthetic alternatives. And what it means to be synthetic is it basically means made in a lab, often out of plastic. And the reason we choose to use synthetic alternatives to the natural products is because of the fact that uh, we are taking up so much land uh, now with planting natural resources um, that it just requires too much land. Um, so it's easier to make a lot of these things out of plastic. Now that doesn't always necessarily mean it will be better for the environment though. And a massive problem is the fact that we are producing so many synthetic plastic products to rem to replace these natural materials. And um, it's now starting to uh, have drastic impacts on our environment. So it's always important to weigh up the advantages of natural and synthetic products. Another thing to think about is price as well. Often it's a lot cheaper to produce synthetic alternatives to the natural resource. Different materials uh, have different impacts on our environment and what we can use to assess the impact of different materials over a lifespan is called a life cycle assessment and if we look at this car here we are just going to uh, have a quick look at things that could affect the life cycle of this car and the impact that it has on its environment. The first thing we've got to look at is the collection of raw materials needed to make a car like this. Now, these include lots of different parts because it's a car. It's got loads of different components to it. For example, we're going to need things uh, like crude oil to make all the plastics. In addition to this, we are probably going to have some leather seats because we are feeling a fancy and leather comes from cows. And there is probably going to be some metals in there as well, extracted from the ground. And each one of these uh, different ways of getting uh, these raw materials have their own pros and cons. For example, uh, crude oil with plastics. It's quite a cheap resource at times. Uh, however, the impact it has on the environment is not so great. Plastics, not biodegradable. Also, you've got to think about it. You're going to have to drill into the ground and that can cause problems as well. Now, as well as collecting the raw materials, we've then got to manufacture the product. And the manufacturing of the product 
is going to require energy, isn't it? Because you're going to have to put all the pieces of that car together. Then you've got to think this car's got to get to where it needs to be. And that could be a long way away. It's going to need to be distributed. Uh, and the distribution can be really bad uh, for the overall carbon footprint of the car. Say, for example, if the car is made in Japan and it's got to go to Europe, things like that. So the transport uh, could be not great for the environment. Then during its life, what is its impact on the environment? Oh, well, you can, you've got to think about it. Maybe it needs parts replacing. What's its general impact uh, while in use? For example, cars uh, burn petrol um, and burning petrol is not good for the car's carbon footprint. Then also what we've got to consider is the life after the car has been used, which is how we will dispose of it. Now, some of it might be recycled, which takes us right back to the start of this um, cycle. Uh, <laughs> recycling the car uh, is the best outcome, really. However, some parts might have to go to landfill. The plastics, for example, maybe they will no longer be useful anymore and only the expensive bits of the car will be kept and used again. In the next bit of the topic, we are going to look at water, how we collect our water and how we treat it to make it safe to drink. Now, a source of drinking water is called potable water. And potable water is different to uh, pure water. Pure water doesn't contain the minerals that we need. So we call drinking water potable water. Now, in the UK, where do we get our potable water from? We get it from lakes and reservoirs predominantly. Now, you can sometimes get some underground water as well and use that as a source of water. But what do we have to do to this water before it is safe for us to drink and we can uh, therefore drink it or use it for going in the shower or washing our clothes with? What treatments does it have to go under first? Well, firstly, it has to be sterilized. This basically means to kill any microorganisms that might be harmful uh, in it. And we sterilize our water with chlorine. And sometimes as well, we also sterilize it with UV as well. This kills any harmful microorganisms that are in there. And we also filter. Uh, we filter the reason why is to remove any solids that might be suspended in it. Once it's been sterilized and filtered, we can safely distribute that safe drinking potable water around the UK. However, not all countries have large sums of water, lots of lakes and reservoirs and underground supplies. So what do they have to do in order to get enough water? Well, they actually utilize the sea. They use the salt water from the sea and they use something called distillation in order to uh, obtain their potable water. So what they do is they will do a distillation and that produces pure water. Then with this pure water, they have to add the minerals required to make it basically better for you. Pure water, if you drink it, isn't that good for you. It's the minerals inside it uh, that help out. An example of a, a mineral that we add to our water is fluorine, uh, uh, fluoride, sorry. And we add fluoride to our water because of the fact that it helps our teeth. As well as using a lot of water, we create a lot of 
wastewater. And we have to manage this or else we would pollute a lot of our clean water that we use for drinking. So we need to use wastewater facilities for all our sewage. And where does our sewage go? For example, when you flush the toilet or you've had a shower, where does it go? Well, the first step to treating our water is screening it. And basically what this does is it removes all the large waste. And this could be uh, lots of different things. It could be poo, it could be toilet paper. All of that gets removed um, in the screening process. Now, not all waste, however, is incredibly large. So we need to remove the smaller uh, insoluble uh, waste using what's called a primary settlement tank. And what happens here is it slows the water down and you can actually see the settlement tanks uh, in the photos here. This is what this stage here is. So in the primary settlement tank, the water's slowed and the solid goes to the bottom. And actually what that arm is doing as well is taking down um, any oils that have settled at the top. Oils and fats sometimes settle at the top and that arm is just taking them away. Now after that, uh, the water needs to be um, basically made safe again. And it's made safe in a few ways. We sterilize it using chlorine. and some UV. Sometimes even some useful bacteria are put in at this stage. And then finally, we filter the water again, and then we can uh, send it back to the people, send it back to river systems, and it is all safe again. Now, also things to consider when we are treating our wastewater is the fact we can get some useful products along the way. <laughs> An example is from the primary settlement. All these solids that have sunk to the bottom, we can use them as fertilizers. That's a really nice thing to, for the farmers to spread on their field all of your human feces. And also we can use the gases. Uh, we can actually use the gas and um, make biogas from this as well. Basically, poo power, uh, we, we store up this gas and we can burn it in order to make electricity. The last thing we have to do in this topic is look how we extract one of our most important resources, which is copper. Now, the main way we extract copper from its ore is using a technique called smelting. And just before we move on, I'll explain that word uh, ore a bit as well. Uh, what a copper ore is, it basically means that the copper is uh, in there with other things, okay? Um, there is enough copper in there for us to extract it and to be profitable, but the copper is not pure. Um, is basically being stored in a rock and we need to get all the other things out of there other than copper. So what we do is we heat it to a really high temperature and react it with oxygen and this basically makes impure copper oxide. And then what we do is we use this impure copper as the positive electrode in an electrolysis and this helps us produce pure copper. Now this technique of smelting requires lots of energy. You've got to think you've got to heat it to a really high temperature then you've got to supply electricity for the electrolysis. It's going to require a lot of energy, it's going to require a lot of money and it's going to require a lot of carbon dioxide to produce, be produced in creating them high temperatures as well. So a lot of research has gone into uh, some other techniques that we could use to extract the copper, um, which could be better for the environment. And one of them is bioleaching. Uh, basically, this is using bacteria 
uh, to extract the copper. And the bacteria will grow around the copper ore and they uh, produce something called leachate and then an electrolysis uh, is carried out on this leachate to produce poor, pure copper. Now, unfortunately, bioleaching is very slow and can take lots of years for all of these bacteria to carry out the job because it's a variety of different chemical reactions that need to take place. The other technique you could do is something called phytomining. And what happens in phytomining is we use plants to extract the copper. Now, what we do is we plant some plants um, in some copper-rich soil and copper-rich areas. And then what we do is we burn the plants to leave behind. Now, both of these techniques are longer techniques. However, as copper resources are wearing thin, these techniques are definitely being more researched uh, as potential alternatives to smelting. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please remember if you have to like the video and drop it a subscribe.